Because when they're asking for what image, Lily, they mean what slice, not what study. Good morning, everyone. It is 7.04 in the morning, and I am on stroke call this week. Typically, our neuroradiology rotation starts at 7.30, and someone like me who is on stroke call needs to be able to pick up the pager at 7.30, so I show up a little early. It's my first time on stroke call, so I just showed up extra early to be ready for whatever is to come today. We have a new attending every day that we sign out to, so we'll see how this week goes. I'm super nervous. <laughs> The fellow is covering the stroke pager for me so that I can go get my N95 uh, mass fit testing. I fit a small this time around. When I was at my last facility, I was actually not able to qualify for any of these masks and I had to get one of those like over the head astronaut looking domes. So I'm glad that I'm finally able to fit this again. All right, back to stroke call. All right, I survived my first shift holding the stroke pager. I got four stroke pages, actually five stroke pages today. One of them actually happened when I went out to get my N95 fit testing and I actually had to hand over my pager to the fellow who was very kind and took care of the pager while I was gone for about 30 minutes and of course a stroke code was called and he had to read that imaging but thank goodness for him shout out to him for helping me out it's so interesting to me that they put our ones on the stroke pager it's a lot of it's very time sensitive when a patient comes in with stroke symptoms there is a lot of metrics that need to be met by the hospital one of which is that patient needs to get imaged and the radiologist needs to read the imaging and call neurology within 20 minutes so within 20 minutes that the patient's images actually upload into our PAC system, we need to be scrolling through the CT head without contrast. We do a CT head without contrast because oftentimes we're looking for blood. This is very pertinent to neurology and what they do to treat strokes because if they need to give any type of TPA or blood thinners, they need to know if there's any hemorrhage in the brain. And to see that, we need a CT head without contrast. Of course, if you give contrast, contrast in blood, look the same in the brain so for those of you who are new interns if you're working in the ed never order a ct head with and without contrast just order a ct head without contrast if you're looking for blood in the brain anyways that's a little protocoling tangent that i just went on but otherwise a lot of it's time sensitive so basically the workflow goes like this there is a stroke code that happens overhead. Then I wait for the page that actually happens to go into my pager. That's when I get all of the patient pertinent information like their MRN and what kind of neuro deficits they have. Say this patient is coming in with right-sided weakness and some slurred speech, whatever it is. I see it there in the page as well as their last known well time. I get that information and I take a look at the CT head when it's uploaded. As an R1, I get to scroll through that CT head and then send a message to my attending. Sometimes my attendings are sitting nearby and I could just pop in and tell them. And then we talk about the case. It's very quick because like I said, this needs to happen very quickly. Today, even on my first stroke, I was able to recognize areas of the brain that seem to be underperfused and it looks a little darker or hypodense on the CT scan. If it's bright or hyperdense, you're worried about a bleed. And I've, I had both of those today. One where it looked darker in the brain, and one where it looked brighter in the brain. These are findings that I end up calling to the ED physician or the neurologist. I take their name and I put it in the chart that I communicated the findings to them. And that's about it. So that's kind of the workflow for being on stroke call. And I'm going to be doing that all week this week. After noon, I'm going to run club with a bunch of other residents, not just in radiology, but in other specialties. And then tomorrow morning we have didactics. So I don't have to come in at 730. I can come in at 8 and we have didactics from 8 until 1.20. So I'm not on stroke call again until tomorrow at 1.30 in the afternoon. I think it's really nice that my program has didactics all in one day. Some programs will give you noon didactics five days a week and you get one hour each time. 
my program decided to put all of our didactics into one half day and so we get five lectures on Tuesday mornings and we get to all spend it together and it really helps break up the week so I come in on a Monday I work all day tomorrow I have a, a good chunk of my day is didactics I only have a couple hours of work after didactics and then it just feels like a three-day work week after that and then it's the weekend all right let's get home and eat dinner before the resident run all right Chris and I are on our way to run club <laughs> He's always representing the Arizona flag. That's right. Wait, that's not the Arizona flag. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, I think the Arizona flag has this on it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> It's Wednesday. Yesterday I had lecture for half of the day. Part of it was Epic training. Epic is the EMR that we use at my institution. They also catered lunch. They cater lunch for us once a month during these didactic days, which was really nice. I had like a taco bowl. They had an hour where they talked about the state of the residency to kind of let us know where they came from, how the residency program has grown. I didn't know this, but the program that I'm in used to only have 20 residents total through all four of the residency classes. And now there's 43 of us. So obviously the program has like now doubled in size, which is supposed to affect the amount of call that we take, hopefully less call and give us more flexibility on when we can take days off. I hope that we will feel that in this class. There is vacation that I want to take off during one of our restricted months and I don't know if I'm going to get it approved but we'll see. Part of what makes it difficult is that my husband is a teacher and he works an academic schedule so I have to try to coordinate my vacation to when he has vacation and oftentimes other people are doing the same thing because they have children who are in school and so they want to coordinate their vacation to their children's vacation as well if that makes sense and then that kind of restricts us to when we could take time off together. I am on stroke call, so one of the things that surprised me is that before starting radiology residency, I thought that radiology was Monday through Friday, eight to five, but actually some of the rotations we do have to show up before eight, and one of it is neuroradiology, which is the rotation that I'm on right now. I have to make sure that I'm at work and picking up the stroke pager by 7.30. I'm on stroke call this whole week, so I will go in and, and basically just sign on to the pager system, pick it up and put my name on the pager, and I will get the stroke calls all day. Every single day I work with a new attending and I staff with the new attending. You know, obviously over the next four years I'll get to know these people, but it's so whiplash to meet someone new every single day and staff with them. It is now Wednesday night. It's actually 9 p.m. I didn't get to the gym until 8 p.m. because I had dinner with one of the upper level seniors in our residency program. She's done a lot to reassure me um, as well as tell me that I'm not alone in all the struggles that I'm feeling as an R1. So that was really reassuring and I just appreciate seniors who reach out and try to help us are ones that are struggling. I survived another day on stroke call and actually I have a story to tell you guys. When I showed up to work today at 7.30, I got there actually a little bit earlier than 7.30 because 7.30 is when I actually have to pick up the stroke pager. We had an IT outage, which is something that I always wondered about because what happens to radiologists if there is no PAC system? PAC is what we use to actually look at the images. That's the software that is used and what loads the images onto the screens. What happens when that system goes down? 
There's a backup system that we can use, but there was a lot of chaos in knowing how those were assigned and how to read them and who to send it off to because we are trainees and these studies that we read need to be sent off to an attending. Anyways, that was kind of chaotic this morning. My attending today, the person that was assigned to me was actually the chief of the IT division in radiology. So he was super helpful, but he was also super busy today going to all the meetings to fix the IT issues. We got it up and running super quick, and right away I got a bunch of stroke pages. Throughout the day, I probably got eight stroke pages. I ended up reading about five of them. That is because sometimes we get stroke pages that have an ETA much later in the day, and then they don't end up showing up during my shift. So then the night person will take over and read those. So when a patient comes in with a stroke, we read a CT head without contrast, and we read a CTA taking a look at the big vessels in the neck and the head and making sure that they're not stenosed or narrowed. They don't have a large vessel occlusion. A lot of the times when we're looking at this, we just wanna know if there's a bleed in the brain. I love that we get to see so much volume of cases. Like when I was in internal medicine as an intern, I was seeing maybe nine patients a day, but today I get to see like 25 different cases because not only do I get to see all the cases that I read, I also get to see all the cases that the fellow who is signing out to the same attending as me, what he reads. And he obviously is so much more advanced than me. So the cases that he reads are super interesting, way more interesting than the ones I read because I need to read the easy things before I can get to really hard pathology that he, he's doing as a neurology, as a neuroradiology fellow. So it's really cool to hear him read out to the attending as well. So, so far, a pretty good day. I had a wonderful attending who actually was interested in getting to know who I am. I really like personal attendings like that. You don't always have that, especially if you have a new attending each day. Not everyone has the bandwidth to try to get to know each resident. So sometimes it can feel lonely. Other than that, I met up with that awesome senior and we had some dinner. She was awesome. She's inspiring me to do breast radiology, which is a procedural based subspecialty of radiology. And I'm excited to learn more about that. In this program, I actually get to do breast radiology for two weeks during my first year. Some radiology programs don't have breasts in the first year at all. Something that I definitely considered when I was interviewing for radiology programs. What else do I got to tell you guys about today? Oh, and of course, I just went to the gym. I confused pool day a little bit. Sometimes I'm just like, let me just go and get some movement in. I did triceps on a pool day. And I don't know if you guys do a lot of weightlifting, but triceps is a push. This triceps movement is a push movement. Anyways, I did that, but I, I ended up doing biceps too. I think that's all I gotta say. Everyone, it's the end of the week. It's Friday. I did not film anything yesterday. I was on stroke call still. Like I said, I'm on stroke call all week. I only got one stroke code, which is pretty nice. And the funny thing is I had a critical finding or what I thought was a critical finding. I was scrolling through one of the head CTs. Actually, it was the CTA head, meaning that there was contrast in all of the vessels to take a look and see if there's any dissection or thrombus. I was scrolling through it and I was looking up the right vertebral and I was like that looks really odd. I've never seen a vertebral artery look like that. So I called the fellow over and I was like, hey, this looks super abnormal. I'm not sure if I need to call the attending. Can you take a look at it for me? And he was like, that looks abnormal. I would call the attending sooner than later. So of course I'm like, okay, I better let the attending know. I messaged the attending. We used something called communicator to talk to each other on the computer. So it's like, hey, critical finding, right vertebral, possible dissection or thrombus, question mark, I don't know. He responds, what image? And I was like, the CTA neck. And then he said, what image though? I was like, oh, <laughs> a uh, series 500 image 127. Because when they're asking for what image, Lily, they mean what slice, not what study. Anyways, that was an embarrassing response. So he goes, scrolls through it and he's like, oh, that's nothing. It's just contrast in the Venus phase. So basically it was like a poorly done study. Contrast was everywhere in the ar arterial system and the venous system. And if you know anything about how that looks on imaging, veins can look really tortuous and it was like layering around where the right vertebral was and looking very mixed. So there were some dark areas and some light areas that confused both me and the fellow. So I do have to say that 
It wasn't just me looking at it thinking this looks odd. The fellow also thought so. Anyways, that was like a newbie rookie move yesterday. I'm sure I'll have many more of those. Then I went home and I finished filming for a brand. Um, I have one of my biggest brand deals coming up and that was exciting. Then I went for a lovely run. We actually have Contrast Sim Lab today, so that'll be nice, a little break from the reading station. I think what people don't understand is that when you're in radiology, unlike when I'm on internal medicine where I can go around to my patients, write my notes, and relax and hang until my admissions come in, with radiology, there's really no break time. There's always a list of images to read. You just read all day. One of the adverse events that can happen when you get imaging done is a reaction to the contrast dye that's injected into your veins. Today, we're doing a sim lab to simulate someone having an anaphylactic reaction to it and how to respond to that because that's a life-threatening event. I'm excited to do that and I'm excited to see my co-interns be able to do that. The most exciting thing is what I'm doing this weekend. I'm going to my first social media event in Philadelphia. I plan to document it all. It's supposed to be like a fashion luxe event with Hippocratic Collective and Go Clove. So I'm super excited about that. I, I do plan to document it. As far as this video, I plan to end it here. I have so much more to learn. I'm trying to figure out a good study schedule for myself, probably in the evenings before bed. I've had a very difficult time getting up in the mornings, so there's no way that I can study in the mornings. But... I'm working on it. Things are slowly coming together. Things are much easier because now I'm a little more familiar with the hospital system and how to get around. A lot of the first week's struggle and what I was struggling with so much in the last video was that it was it was not just a new, completely new residency program that I was starting. Starting a new life in a new city, starting a new career new job in a new hospital, figuring out how to get around the hospital. All of that's becoming a lot more familiar, so I'm feeling a little bit better this week, although I'm still very overwhelmed and working on it. So thank you for watching the video this week. In the next video, you'll see all about my social media event that I'm going to this weekend. If you're a nurse who is interested in going to medical school, know that I have a guide that I've written. I will link that all in the description and I'm happy to answer any questions you have on that journey. Thanks for watching.